Christmas Day by Laurie Lee On Christmas Day, dressing was formal. For the boys, velvet suits, starch collars and hair shining with Vaseline. For the girls, best dresses and new pinafores. We tumbled downstairs, three steps at a time, into the kitchen's glow. The fire was ablaze and Mother had already started the breakfast, frying great pans of eggs and bacon. We sat down to the finest breakfast of the year, which included real cream and porridge. Listen, children, cried Mother, suddenly cocking her head. Well, isn't that pretty? Now fancy that. With our mouths full of bacon, we ran out into the yard and stood listening in the snow. Then we heard it, the pealing of Painswick bells, the traditional and joyous sound coming faint but clear over the distant hill like icicles stirred by the wind ringing Christmas in the valley. Our own village bell started up soon after, cool as a snowdrop calling us all to church. There were no dissenters that morning. Everyone turned out, from the gentry in their carriages to the farmers and their bonneted wives in carts. For us choir boys there were new robes, cold as sheets of tin, which we donned hurriedly in the shivering vestry. Then with peak chinks glow glowing, faces modestly composed, sweets hidden beneath our tongues, we followed the snow-haired vicar to our place in the stalls to a resounding peal on the organ. Unto us a child is born, unto us a prince is given. We sang it full-throated, knowing it to be true. After a brief sermon, the vicar released us with his blessing, and the rest of the day was ours. Back home we found that Grandpa had come, and a couple of whiskered uncles, all wearing brown polished gaiters. Eddies of tempting smells filled the crowded kitchen. Mince pies, hot pastry, the tang of freshly chopped parsley, the tingling aroma of the goose, which was far too big for the oven, and hung turning on a spit before the roaring fire, its fat dripping into a small brass dish. Nothing could be hurried. Christmas dinner was sacred and the waiting was part of its price. When all was ready at last, the table had never looked more beautiful. The decorated plates, the paper napkins which appeared only once a year, the dishes steaming with vegetables and the little willow pattern saucers full of dates and nuts and figs. We sat in our places confidently clutching our knives and forks, knowing that this was one occasion when we could eat our fill and when there would even be second helpings. Plates clattered up and down the table, returning laden with helpings of crackling goose. All over the village it would be like this. Families gathered for their feast of the year, proud and flustered mothers giving their star performances the old and toothless blissfully chewing, the young gorging themselves, grinning fatly at, the, at each other, babies in high chairs sucking marrow bones. Finally came the climax of the meal, the pudding, steaming royally on its china dish, a great ball of glory as black as night with a bunch of holly twinkling on top. Grandpa fished from his pocket a tiny medicine bottle of brandy, poured it over the pudding and set it alight. Whiskers of pale flame began to purr and flicker around it, dancing over the surface like tremors of lightning. We all cheered and Mother blushed. I hope it boiled long enough, she murmured. Then she ladled it out with a fiery spoon, a great dollop for every plate. It was the last of the orgy, a surfeit of richness. We searched each morsel for the lucky sixpence, and each child found one to our astonished delight. The uncles had seen to that. Christmas dinner over, the elders slumped in their chairs, supping ginger wine, their voices furry and sentimental. So we left them to doze among the orange peel and walnuts while we, while we ran out into the snow-filled lanes. 
At this hour in the village, mid-afternoon Christmas, only the children seem to be left alive. The boys trying out their pop guns, pelting each other with snowballs or whizzing up and down on the frozen pond. The girls, far more sedate, showing off their bright new ribbons, lace-up boots and rabbit fur muffs. Night came early, with the valley and its woods closing in darkly around the house. Now was the time to light the tree, its branches loaded with tinsel, with silver cut-out moons and stars, and with the clip-on candles, each a living tongue of flame, building up a pyramid of dancing light. Mother put out the oil lamps, one by one, and we stood hushed and entranced together, adoring the tree and its chaste white glare coated all over in frosty fire. The precious day was dying. We boys struggled to keep awake. Our eyes shadowed like burnt-out candles. How could we leave this beautiful tree? We piled our toys at the foot of our beds, and Mother tucked us up, her shadow large on the ceiling, thrown by the beams of a single candle. As long as she was there, it was still Christmas. As long as she held the light in our room... The day somehow could not end. We clung desperately to this last moment. Then Mother left us, and the angle of the candle grew narrower on the wall and finally went out, closing that day forever.